lecture number four um, on uh, manufacturing engineering one. Um, just to, as a reminder, the session will be recorded. So if you want to switch off your cameras, please do so. Uh, if you've got any questions, please raise your hands and I'll try to answer your questions during the lecture or towards the end of the lecture. So today we will be talking about uh, two um, additive manufacturing systems. The first one will be uh, fused deposition modeling. I'll try to give you a brief uh, historical perspective um, how the system was invented and how these systems have evolved over the years. We're going to be looking a bit more in detail in terms of the working principle, uh, some of the materials, the more common materials that can be used in fused deposition modeling, uh, some of the major applications and specific advantages and limitations of fused deposition modeling. And uh, then we'll be talking about VAT photopolymerization, in particular about sterolithography, which is quite a different system from uh, FDM. And uh, we're going to be looking as well in terms of uh, historical perspective and evolution, how the systems work, the different variations, how can they be used, and uh, again, the materials uh, that are quite important in terms of sterolithography, the applications and the specific advantages of sterolithography and uh, the limitations as well, for example, compared with fused deposition modeling. Okay, so uh, FDM was probably one of the first additive manufacturing systems being uh, developed and commercialized. This is the actual patent that was uh, submitted by Scott Crump, the founder of uh, Stratasys, and the system was uh, developed and patented back in 1992. And actually, uh, 1992 or the, the, the 90s were quite uh, important for additive manufacturing because most of the additive manufacturing systems were uh, developed in the 90s. Uh, it was quite a rudimental system at the time, but the working principle uh, remained basically the same. So you have um, a filament of material that is pulled into this uh, extrusion uh, print head, is melted, and then it's uh, extruded into this platform that in this case had X and Y displacements. So as we've seen in the previous lectures, um, we normally have a filament spool where you have your uh, thermoplastic material. So it's very common in uh, fuse deposition modeling to use thermoplastic materials, so materials that can be melted and solidified. The material is then pulled inside this extrusion head by these rollers. And once inside this uh, print head is melted and then force through a nozzle that can have different geometries and dimensions and deposit it into uh, the building platform where it will uh, solidify. As we've said before, there are different uh, variations in terms of the configuration of these systems. Quite often, or probably the most common ones, is to have the X, Y displacement on the building platform and the printing head only moves vertically. However, uh, some other systems, uh, commercial systems, can work differently. So they can have all the movements in the print head, or they can have, for example, uh, X, Y displacements on the print head, so move horizontally on uh, the print head, and the platform only goes up and down. But independently of that, this is the common uh, setup in terms of uh, fuse deposition uh, modeling. So after the first layer is printed, the material is still in a semi-molten state and another layer is deposited on top of the previous one uh, where it will bond into the previous layer. And the process is repeated until you obtain your three-dimensional uh, physical object. It is important, however, that we have control over the temperature, not just in the print head, where we need to melt the material, 
but also on the building platform. And these temperatures should be just below the melting temperature of the material to ensure that the material remains in the semi-molten state to promote the adhesion first to the building platform uh, so that it doesn't detach during uh, the printing process, but then also to ensure that we promote full bonding between uh, layers um, of material. Uh, I don't have time to show you a video uh, where it illustrates the entire process, but you can go to the Blackboard page uh, to week number two and consult or watch video uh, one about uh, fused deposition modeling. I think we've got a question. Hi, sir. Um, yeah. With the, you know, when you're building the, um, you've got the actual thing you want to build and you've also got the support structures, which is made from like the PVA or other material. Yes. Can you just yes. separate nozzle for that or is it coming all from the same stuff and, uh, and its own filament spool? Yes, yes, you do. So you need different print sets. So it's basically replicating exactly what you have in here in this system. So you need uh, one filament spool with the material that you're going to use to build your parts, to fabricate your parts. And then you need another filament spool and another print head with another nozzle for the support material. So they need to be uh, in separate positions. And then you can select which one you want to use. That is normally done automatically. Once you select uh, where you want your support materials, that is done automatically, as you've seen yesterday, by the software of the printing system to ensure that the support material is deposited in the right places to uh, support the building of your part. So we'll alternate between them and then move on to the next layer once you've got the complete horizontal. Exactly. Source. So in the same, in the same layer, um, you can have both building and support materials. Okay. That is that normally are deposited by different print heads. Thank you, Anna. How, how thick is each layer? That actually depends on the machine, okay? It depends on the resolution of the machine. So normally the resolution of these systems is uh, related with the layer thickness that they can print. Uh, but it, it really depends uh, on the system that you get. For example, for uh, low cost machines, um, they can nowadays buy for less than a thousand pounds, you get, you don't get quite a lot of resolution. Okay. So you can print filaments of a few hundreds of microns, but if you go to more industrial systems, you can go to, um, uh, filaments that can be printed, um, of sub micron resolution almost. Thank you. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, so as I've said in, at, the, at the beginning, there are some variations in terms of the fused deposition modeling system. So the most common setup requires uh, the use of a pre-filament. So you need to actually be able to fabricate a pre-filament and then use a spool of that filament to fit into your print head. And, but that obviously brings some limitations because you need to fabricate that filament um, and that will uh, obviously have an impact in terms of the fabrication time of your parts um, and also it gives you uh, less flexibility in terms of development of materials. So in order to overcome that, there have been developed uh, some uh, different extrusion uh, mechanisms for uh, fuse deposition modeling. And nowadays, you can use basically two systems, one that is uh, piston driven or uh, pressure assisted and another one that it's a screw assisted system. And there are some differences between these two. So in the case of the piston assisted, you obviously have a plunge that can be pneumatically uh, driven to push the material uh, downwards and force the material through the nozzle into the building platform or you can drive this piston with, for example, a stepper motor. And obviously using a stepper motor gives you a better control over the flow of the semi-molten material 
into the building platform. And obviously that will have an impact in terms of the accuracy and resolution of your parts. The other system is the screw assisted system. And in this case, instead of having this piston to push the material downwards, what you have is a rotational screw that will promote the extrusion of the material. The rotational speed of the screw is uh, controlled by a, stem, a stepper motor, for example, and it has some advantages when compared to uh, the piston uh, driven systems. So in this case, because you have a screw, you can actually print materials that are uh, much more viscous. Also, because of the use of this screw that allows you to have a better control over the flow of the material that comes out of the nozzle, you can also produce parts with higher accuracy and in shorter periods of time, because the flow of the material can also be higher using the screw assisted systems. But in the case of medical applications, as we've seen in the previous lectures, where we've said that, for example, in bioprinting, where we try to combine uh, biological materials with cells to create human tissue replacements, in that case, because we have a screw that will generate heat, but also uh, shear stresses, that can be damaging not just for the biological materials that we use, but mainly in terms of the viability of the human cells that we're trying to print. So in this case, uh, and for uh, medical applications, uh, these systems are not convenient because of that. And piston-driven uh, systems are then uh, preferred over the screw-assisted systems. In terms of the disadvantages of the pistons, uh, obviously you need to use uh, lower viscosity materials when compared to the screw. Uh, also, uh, the accuracy is uh, lower and the resolution is lower um, and also you have higher uh, production times because of uh, the speed and the control uh, that you have over the extrusion process. Okay, so it is important that you know that the common setup requires the use of a pre-filament. There are variations, too many variations in terms of extrusion-based mechanisms, uh, the piston and the screw, and they have specific advantages and limitations that you need uh, to know. And also independently of uh, the system. Sorry, Pauline, do you have, do you have a question? Yes, please. Uh, it yes. might sound silly, but why does the liquid come out uh, from the screw if not because of pressure difference? Why does the liquid come out of the screw assisted system? Yes. Was that, was that your question? Yes, that was. So the extrusion of the material, once it's melted in the screw assisted systems, that uh, happens because basic rotating uh, the screw and through the rotation of the screw, you will push the material uh, out of the nozzle. Okay, so that's the reason why the material is extruded. Just similar to any other uh, extrusion process they have in the industry or, for example, in injection molding. So you are compressing the material, you are rotating the screw and you are forcing the material to be compacted and forced through uh, a nozzle. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. So, as I was saying before, um, independently of the system that you use, either screw or piston assisted, there are several and common parameters that need to be controlled. And by controlling those process parameters, you can have a direct control over the flow of the material and as a consequence on uh, the accuracy and the, the, the strength, uh, the mechanical stability of your extruded parts. So in an ideal scenario, what you want to achieve is the case represented here on the left. So what you can see here uh, 
with the dotted lines. So this is the actual tool path. So it's the center corresponds to the center of the printing nozzle. And here is the deposit material boundary. So the boundaries of the filaments that you are printing. And ideally what you want to promote in the XY plane is the materials to be deposited and adjacent to each other. So they need to be in contact so that they can uh, bond to each other in uh, the plane. What you don't want is this overlapping between uh, filaments in the same plane, because if this happens, you will undermine your uh, accuracy, not just uh, dimensional accuracy, but also uh, the geometrical accuracy of your parts. So in order to obtain this uh, kind of deposition, you need to have a very uh, good control over different process parameters. And the, the main goal, on top of obviously ensuring the geometrical and dimensional accuracy of your parts, is to try to produce the parts uh, in the shortest time possible um, in order to uh, maximize the production um, in any uh, industrial environment. So, as we said, the precise control of uh, extrusion can be uh, sometimes a complex trade-off dependent uh, on a significant number of uh, parameters, okay? And some of them are common uh, to these different extrusion-based mechanisms. And as I was saying, these parameters need to be tuned in order uh, first to uh, minimize the production time, but importantly, without compromising the structural uh, integrity and accuracy of the printed parts. So obviously, as we've said, and because of the nature of the materials, so thermoplastic materials that need to be melted and solidified in order to create 3D printed parts, uh, we need to have a very good control over the melting temperature. And we need to have control uh, uh, over the melting temperature in the printhead. There are other temperatures that we can control, as we said, in the building platform. But importantly, this melting temperature uh, needs to be precisely controlled because it has a direct influence on the fluidity of the molten material. So if you increase the melting temperature, maintaining all other parameters constant, what will happen is that the fluidity of the material will increase because the viscosity decreases and you will have an increase in terms of the diameter of the filament. And just bear in mind that uh, if you have a nozzle with an internal diameter, let's say of 500 microns, ideally the diameter of your printed filament should also have 500 microns. In all uh, parameters, process parameters should be tuned to achieve that uh, specific filament diameter. Um, I think there is a question. Please go ahead. I think you'll need to unmute yourself. Hello? Yeah. So um, when you say melting temperature, are you referring to the like just changing the material in order to have materials that melt at different temperatures or the temperature that we're melting the material at within the pressure? Head? So uh, each, each material that you use, independently if it is the building material or the support material, each of these materials has a specific melting temperature. So a temperature at which the material will transition, will... Uh, uh, change from a solid state into a liquid or semi-molten state, okay? And that is defined as an intrinsic property of the material. So you need to make sure that the temperature inside your print head is set uh, to be the same as the melting temperature of uh, the material that you are using or just above that, okay? To ensure that the material uh, will uh, melt. Shalom, do you want to um, ask a question as well? Yes, yeah, so um, just following on from that, um, 
why is it that a material with the higher melting temperature is going to be more fluid? Wouldn't it be just as fluid as a material with melting temperature at a temperature? Why is it a higher fluidity when it's um, a substance which is um, yeah. material with a you know, stronger structure or whatever it is that causes that mel melting temperature to higher? Yeah. So, uh, pre probably I haven't um, explained myself properly. What, what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to say with the melting temperature is, so let's say that you're using a material that melts at 60 degrees. What this means is that most of the bonds between the molecular chains of the material will be disrupted at this temperature, okay? And this will allow you to actually be able to uh, extrude the material because it's going to be in um, in a in a in a in a melted state okay in a in a almost liquid state if you keep on increasing the temperature for this same material you're going to be able to disrupt more of these intermolecular bonds and by doing so you'll have less resistance of these molecular chains to the flow of the material okay Obviously, there is an upper limit to that because once you disrupt all of these uh, bonds between the different molecular chains of the material, then the, the fluidity of the material will not be um, effective anymore. So that's why it is easier uh, to actually extrude the material if you increase the temperature because you're going to be able to disrupt more of these uh, bonds between the molecular chains. Yeah. OK, so on top of the melting temperature, and this is specific to uh, piston assisted uh, systems uh, that are activated pneumatically. If we increase the pressure um, to actually drive the piston, obviously what will happen is that we'll have more material coming out. And as a consequence, uh, if we maintain all other parameters constant, the diameter of the filament will also uh, increase. And the same in an analogous way will happen uh, in screw driven systems if we increase the rotational speed. So by increasing the rotational speed, we'll force more material uh, coming out through the nozzle. So the flow of the material will be higher, the flow rate, and therefore the filaments will also be uh, larger. And another important parameter that we can control is the scanning speed. So the speed at which the printhead uh, moves along the building platform. And again, maintaining the screw rotation speed constant, the melting temperature constant, and all other parameters constant. If we increase the scanning speed, what we'll have is a decrease in terms of the filament uh, diameter. And this is mainly because you are stretching uh, the filament of the material and therefore you are uh, uh, creating filaments that are uh, thinner. Obviously, you need to be uh, careful because you don't want to disrupt uh, the filaments. So there is obviously upper and lower limiters that uh, for, for each one of these process parameters and the range uh, of values that you can use is obviously dependent on the printing system that you use, but also uh, it depends quite a lot on the materials that you select for both uh, building the part as well as to build the support uh, structures. And talking about support structures, and as you've seen yesterday, these are also uh, quite important, especially in uh, fused deposition models. They're normally used to support the part uh, that you are printing. And the general rule is that every time you have a structure or part that has overhanging uh, structures, so with um, a degree, uh, at least 45 degrees, normally you need to use support structures. Otherwise, uh, they will uh, crash. So you won't be able to build and they won't be self-supportive. So you need to actually create support structures to be able to continue uh, or to continue depositing uh, material 
uh, in the z direction or in the vertical direction. And also, as mentioned yesterday, it is important to uh, define very well the direction of the printing in your part. So the orientation of your part in the building platform will also have an impact in terms of uh, the number of support structures that you will need to create your parts. And this is a very good example. So in this case, if we decide to uh, place our uh, printed parts in this direction in the building platform, then we'll need to use uh, support structures in these regions to support the printed parts. But if you just change the orientation of the parts, then there is no need for support structures because the previous layers will support the weight of the layers that are deposited on top of the previous ones. Okay, so this is uh, important. And as some of you has, have asked before, this is normally done using uh, at least two printing heads. You can have more printing heads if you have the need to use more building materials. But normally for the support structures, there's only one uh, print head. Um, obviously, I don't, I don't need you to know all these materials in detail. What it is important for you to have uh, in mind is that the range of materials that we can process with uh, fuse deposition modeling is quite vast. Normally, they need to be thermoplastic materials, uh, and this is important because we need to be able to melt them and solidify them without degrading uh, the properties of the materials. But you can choose from a wide range of materials, some that are more uh, rigid, some other materials that are much more uh, flexible, so we can use uh, elastomeric materials as well to create parts with high flexibility. Uh, and also, you can choose materials with uh, different colors, uh, materials that have also different uh, transparency, uh, and that obviously will depend on the final application of your uh, part. But obviously, you don't need to know all these um, definitions, all these specific names of the materials like polylactic acid or polyvinyl alcohol. You just need to know that the range of materials is vast. Normally, they need to be elast uh, thermoplastic materials uh, and that the range of properties, mechanical properties, uh, is also uh, quite broad. And because of this uh, wide range of materials, the number of applications for fuse deposition modeling is also quite uh, broad. Uh, from uh, detailed architectural models, so models that used to be done uh, manually can now be done automatically using uh, 3D printing. Uh, and this is quite an advantage for uh, architectures. Also, you can create concept models or um, prototypes that are not functional, but just for marketing purposes. Uh, surrogate parts, and this is quite common in the automotive industry. Uh, you can also create different functional prototypes. So uh, parts that can also have specific functions that are not just uh, prototypes for marketing uh, purposes. Depending on the, the system that we use, and as we've mentioned before, uh, you can buy uh, 3D printing uh, uh, FDM-based systems that cost a few hundred pounds, uh, but also uh, industries normally have uh, FDM systems in their factories that cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. And because of that, the resolution can also be quite different. In the case of these industrial setups, uh, what these machines allow you to do is also to create models at a scale that can be used for uh, or in wind tunnel, tunnels to study or to investigate the performance of specific parts. And that is quite useful because you can study at a small scale. You can make changes to your parts, you can optimize the performance. And once validated, you can uh, manufacture either using uh, 3D printing or other uh, more conventional manufacturing systems, your final optimized part. And also importantly, uh, FDM can be used to create tools for other more conventional uh, manufacturing systems like 
for example, metal casting. Yeah, and we'll see and we'll talk about metal casting in uh, the future. But tools uh, for metal casting are quite important. So the creation of patterns and patterns are normally used to uh, generate uh, imprints or molds of the parts that we want to cast. These were normally done uh, either by hand or using CNC machining. But if we want to increase the complexity of the parts that we want to cast, then uh, we would have some limitations using CNC machining or uh, if we have to do that manually. And for that purpose, using uh, FDM, we can create much more complex uh, patterns that will then give shape to our metal cassette parts. Uh, as any other system, fuse apposition modeling has specific advantages and uh, limitations. These extrusion systems are quite attractive for the industry and, and mainly due to the low cost of the, the, the equipment. Uh, as, as I've said before, you can nowadays buy a 3D printer based on FDM for a few hundreds of pounds um, and assemble that 3D printer at home and use it at home. This is something that was not possible a few years back. But now that most of the patents related to FDM have expired, um, <clears throat> they are much more widely available and at much affordable costs. But also, uh, as we've seen in the previous slides, the diversity of the materials and the ease of operation of these systems. So these, this is, these are some of the reasons that make this uh, extrusion-based um, 3D print is quite attractive, but it, uh, it presents some uh, important uh, limitations or drawbacks. On top of the need uh, for some of the systems to create the prefilaments and the high processing temperatures, depending on the material that we use for uh, building our parts and the need to create support structures when we have overhangings, these FDM systems can also be limited in terms, uh, for example, of uh, the build speed. So the build speed on FDM system is mainly reliant on the feed rates and the plotting speed. So the ability or the speed at which we are able to feed uh, filament material into the printing head and the scanning speed. So the speed at which the print head will travel and the positive material on the building platform. And the feed rate is also dependent on uh, our ability to supply material and the rate at which the print head is able to liquefy that material and feed it through the nozzle. So there are substantial improvements that will be required in order to reduce the friction of uh, the system on the mass, for example, of the liquefied chamber and if we're able to do that, if we're able to reduce these overall weights of these components, of these hardware components, we're going to be able to improve the overall speed of uh, FDM. The accuracy, so FDM in general is not the most accurate system uh, in additive manufacturing. Um, FDM machine uh, layer thickness uh, option um, of around 0.078 millimeters. Uh, this is generally available uh, with the highest cost machines, so industrial machines. And uh, because as you increase the resolution and the accuracy of the systems, obviously you will increase uh, the manufacturing time or the printing time. Also, uh, the nozzles, normally they are uh, circular. And because they are circular, in uh, many cases, it's not possible to draw uh, sharp external corners. And this will, again, have an impact on the uh, geometry, on the, 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 the accuracy of the parts that you are printing. But probably more relevant than anything is the anisotropy of your parts. So typically the properties are isotropic in the horizontal plane. So in this um, Y-X plane, but if the raster fill pattern is set to preferentially deposits along a specific direction, then your properties in this horizontal plane will also be uh, anisotropic. 
And in almost every case, the strength of your paths in the vertical direction, so in the Z direction, is less than the strength of your paths in the XY uh, plane. So it is important to build the paths or to orient the paths in your building platform in a way that the major loads or stresses um, are aligned with the uh, XY uh, plane, okay? I think we had a question. You'll have to unmute yourself. Oh uh, yeah, sorry. Um, no worries. I was just wondering, why isn't there square nozzles if that's something that's limiting <laughs> high resolution? That's, it's a very good question. There is research now, so it's much easier um, and uh, to actually fabricate circular uh, nozzles okay? yeah. uh, or cylindrical nozzles. But there is quite a lot of research in terms of development of uh, these, for example, square nozzles, and mainly because of this inability that we have to create very sharp corners. Um, most of these are now fabricated using um, additive manufacturing, uh, like powder bed fusion, uh, but still it's something that uh, needs to be further uh, developed and studied, uh, mainly in terms of how the changes in geometry of your nozzle will affect the flow of the material and uh, obviously how that will then consequently affect uh, the geometrical and dimensional accuracy. Right. So is it more of a problem of kind of the material Met getting through the tight corners of the nozzle and that will cause more drag and things? Exactly. So okay. that is something that is not as well as established uh, as, for example, you have in cylindrical nozzles. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, what is just want to know what is part and is anisotropy i think that's how you pronounce it and isotropic properties okay so basically if you if you look at this uh, 0 and 90 degree uh, example so if you deposit for example uh, your filaments in a plane um, in 0 and 90 degrees and then if you load if you apply a load in this direction, and if you compare the load or the mechanical resistance of the parts in this direction against the mechanical resistance in this direction, they will be the same. Okay, so you have isotropic properties. So you have the same properties independently of the direction of the load. Okay. As in the other case, you don't. So you have different mechanical properties, different different uh, resistance, mechanical resistance, depending on the direction of the load. Okay, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, yeah. Cheers. Okay. Any other questions before we move? So, um, just with the circular nozzle, do you not end up with like cylinders? So that the, won't there be yes. gaps if it's like almost like layers of, layers of yes. cylinders? Yes, you do. And that is one of the problems in uh, fused deposition modeling. When you look at the surface of your uh, builded part, what you'll see is this kind of scale effect, because obviously you, you are depositing uh, cylindrical filaments and they will not be absolutely flat. So you'll always have these um, cylindrical shapes. And that needs, uh, in terms of the surface, we can correct that. Uh, but uh, it's one of the limitations in using uh, fused deposition modeling. Okay. Well, so just on the, um, we said we're trying to finish this, like increase the temperature to increase fluidity. Mm -hmm. If we increase the fluidity too much, won't, won't it kind of spread, won't it kind of spread Absolutely. out almost like Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, Obviously, we need to set the temperature um, to match the melting temperature of the material so that the material is capable of flowing when you apply pressure or you apply rotational speed. 
but you cannot increase it too much because otherwise it will overflow. So when it comes out of the nozzle, it will flow and it will not retain the shape and the dimension um, of the internal um, uh, of the nozzle. So there is a limit to which you can increase this uh, melting temperature. I know so there are other questions. Sorry, go on. Um, so I just want to confirm, we want it just over melting temperature so that it'll, but it'll yes. as soon as it hits the cold surface, it will solidify into position. Exactly. You don't want the material completely uh, liquefied. Okay. What you want is the material in a semi molten state where it's still a bit viscous, but as you apply the pressure on your piston, then you're able to promote the flow of the material. And obviously you don't want the material to be overheated because the more heat you provide to uh, the material after being extruded, you will need more time or it will require more time to solidify and that will delay the printing process, okay? It'll automatically stick the lower layer, right? It will, yes. It will bond automatically. Yeah, so as soon as Thank you. it's, yeah. Okay, so I know there are more questions, but we need to move on and I'll um, remain at the end of the session so that I can answer all those questions, okay? Okay, moving on to uh, VAT photopolymerization. So as I've said before, this is a quite different system from uh, fused deposition modeling. But in a similar way, this was developed, uh, in this case, a, a bit earlier uh, than FDM. It was developed in the 80s by Charles Hull. Charles Hull was considered the pioneer in terms of additive manufacturing. And he was also the later uh, co-founder of 3D systems, one of the biggest uh, players in terms of additive manufacturing. And there's probably most of the great breakthroughs in terms of research. Uh, this happened by chance. Uh, Charles was uh, experimenting with uh, UV curable materials uh, by exposing them to a scanning laser. When he actually realized that he was able to transform that liquid uh, photopolymer into a solid pattern. And by curing one layer on top of the other, he could actually fabricate a 3D solid part. And this was actually the beginning of stereolithography. It was the beginning of additive manufacturing, and it was the beginning of uh, many other things, like, for example, as you've seen in the previous lectures, uh, the name of the files that we use in uh, additive manufacturing, like STL. Okay, it also derives from this technology that was pioneered by Charles Hu. Uh, again, I'm not going to have time to show you the video, but please do check this video um, on um, Blackboard. Um, Briefly, this is the general or the most common setup in terms of uh, VAT photopolymerization. So normally you have a VAT where you have a, a liquid photopolymer. You have a building platform that uh, can go and dive into this uh, liquid photopolymer. And then you have a laser. Uh, you can have lenses to focus uh, the laser. And then you have a, a group of mirrors that will uh, be used to direct the laser onto the building platform and to generate the patterns that you want to generate by transforming this liquid photo photopolymer into a solid uh, uh, material. So generally photopolymerization processes do need to use a liquid photocurable uh, resin or photopolymer uh, as a primary material, and this is a, a requisite for uh, stereolithography. One of the advantages of stereolithography is the flexibility that we have in terms of the type of lasers that we can use. The most common one being ultraviolet, but you can also use uh, gamma uh, rays, X-rays, electron beams, and for medical applications, we have now the ability to use visible light that doesn't damage the viability of uh, cells, okay? And one important thing that you need to know is that the process by which we transform this liquid material or resin into a solid is called uh, photopolymerization, okay? 
It's a complex chemical uh, reaction uh, that involves different agents, and we're going to be talking a bit more in detail about uh, that. So similar to FDM, we can have different uh, configurations. Uh, the most common one, or probably the, 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 the original one, was this vector scan or point wise. Uh, and in this case, what we have is a laser beam that is directed into the building platform by these mirrors. And then it will uh, promote this uh, chemical reaction or photopolymerization point by point. Okay, so as it scans the surface, it will uh, create or trigger this reaction at the point of contact between the laser and your liquid photopolymer. The other uh, configuration that we can have is uh, the so-called mass projection or layer-wise. And different from vector scan, here what we have is the total irradiation of each layer at one time. And by doing so, what we have is a higher uh, production rate and uh, on the downside, what you have is a less efficient uh, reaction in terms of energy, because the energy is spread uh, along uh, a larger area. The energy concentration at, one, at each single point will be lower. And because the energy is lower, your ability to trigger the reaction and to convert your uh, liquid material into a solid is also uh, lower. But this is now the most commonly used setup in commercial systems. There are different ways uh, to um, actually control the irradiation of uh, the entire layer, the most common being uh, digital uh, mirror uh, devices. Okay, uh, And we'll talk about that a bit more in detail in uh, tomorrow's lecture. Also, in terms of the materials, there is a big difference uh, between the materials that we use for FDM, for example, and the materials that we need to use for um, SLA. So thermoplastic materials that are the materials that we use in FDM, these are typically uh, used also in injection molding. And in this case, what you have normally is a linear or branched molecular structure that allows your material to be melted and solidified. In a different way, photopolymers are cross-linked and as a result of that cross-linking between the different chains of your polymer, the material will not melt and uh, it will exhibit much less creep and stress relaxation. So in terms of the materials, this is an important uh, difference, okay? In photopolymers, what we have is uh, these cross-linked materials. In fused deposition modeling, what we have is this linear or branched arrangement with very weak bonds between your uh, molecular chains that allow your material to be melted and solidified. Here, the materials, once cross-linked, cannot be melted or you will promote the degradation of the material. So, the photopolymers or the resins that we use in uh, fat photopolymerization are composed of different things. The two most important ones are the monomers or the uh, single units of the material that are then going to be arranged uh, to form the molecular chains and the photo initiators. And the photo initiators are like the triggers for the chemical reaction that will be triggered by the laser. You can, else, you can also have other components like uh, diluents or flexibilizers or stabilizers, or you can also have uh, different additives, um, for example, to add color to your uh, materials. But the two main ones are the monomers and the photo initiators in uh, specific, obviously, concentrations. When uh, UV radiation impinges on uh, the resin or the photopolymer, what happens is that it will go this uh, chemical transformation and become uh, reactive with the monomers. As you provide energy to your liquid resin, you will promote the cross-linking 
between your uh, polymeric chains and you will form two uh, parts. One, that it's the sol part, so two phases, the sol part and the gel part. The gel part is reticulated and cannot be uh, degraded, so you can no longer break these uh, bonds between the polymeric chains, but you can still remove the sol part because it hasn't been cross-linked. As you continue to provide energy to this uh, two-phase solution, you will further promote the reticulation of the material by uh, cross-linking the sol part and obtain a fully cross-linked polymer, fully solidified uh, polymer, okay? So we'll talk about that reaction a bit more in detail. Again, you don't need to know exactly the names of the materials or the commercial names of the materials that are used, but you, need, need, you, need, you do need to know that the most common ones are acrylate-based uh, uh, resins. These have the advantage of being highly reactive. So with lower amounts of energy, we can promote or trigger the cross-linking of uh, your uh, solution, but they generally originate weak parts, mainly due to the shrinkage of your uh, materials. On the other hand, epoxy-based resins, they allow you to create parts uh, with higher accuracy and resolution, also with higher mechanical properties, and mainly because you don't have so much shrinkage when compared to acrylate. But the most common commercial uh, stellar lithography photopolymers or resins are uh, epoxy-based uh, resins with components of acrylates. So basically combining the high reactivity of the acrylate-based uh, 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 resins with the much higher uh, mechanical properties that you can achieve with epoxy-based uh, resins. In terms of applications, these are quite similar to FDM. So you can create uh, 3D printed parts, like for example, these bottle carriers that were developed for the World Cup back in 2014. But one key thing is the higher accuracy and resolution of SLA that actually allows you to build parts with very fine details. And in that case, for example, Formula One teams take advantage of that higher accuracy to bring uh, that into play and create these very well-defined uh, 3D models that they can use to study the performance of different parts in uh, competition cars. You can also create uh, prosthetic implants, um, as we've seen in the previous lectures, um, or you can uh, create other parts uh, for uh, the automotive industry, but also for uh, uh, the jewelry uh, design. And this is mainly because of the resolution that SLA uh, allows you to achieve. So in terms of the advantages, flexibility uh, is one key advantage in terms of SLA. And this mainly uh, happens because the technology allow you to support different machine configurations as we've seen. Uh, you can use vector scan or you can use mask radiation and you can produce at different sizes and at different scales. Also, the different light sources, as we've seen, like UV light, infrared, or combination, allows you to use uh, different types of materials with different properties for different applications. And the size range uh, in terms of the parts I can uh, build um, can also be uh, quite uh, flexible. So you can go from the nanometer scale into the millimeter scale, uh, depending on the technology that you use. The build speed, so mask projection technologies have uh, inherent uh, speed advantage over uh, laser scan and sterile lithography. So as we've seen in the previous slides, if we use a mask, we can uh, cross-link an entire layer of the material. And obviously this allows you to reduce, to reduce the building time um, when compared to vector scan. But the most important one is the accuracy. The accuracy of SLI is much, much higher than any other uh, additive manufacturing system. But we also have some uh, limitations. One obviously is uh, the type of materials that we can use. So we can only 
use photopolymeric materials, materials that can be uh, cross-linked using uh, light. The degradation uh, is also a limitation in SLA. So most photocured parts are known to age, uh, resulting in degraded mechanical properties over time. Post-curing, um, in many uh, situations, uh, products. There are uh, advantages in terms of FDM, uh, the range of materials that we can use, uh, the ease of operation and the low cost of these systems, okay? But speed, accuracy and part anisotropy above all are some of the limitations that we need to be aware when deciding on uh, the type of additive manufacturing system that we want to use to create our parts. In terms of SLA, uh, in this case, we use a liquid photopolymer that we transform into a solid pattern uh, using light and triggering this chemical reaction that we call photopolymerization. There are, uh, similar to FDM, uh, two main configurations, vector scan and mask projection. Uh, mask projection allows you to build much faster by radiating uh, one layer at a time. Uh, as in the case of vector scan, you have a higher efficiency in terms of uh, the reticulation of your material, uh, but you have obviously, uh, longer uh, building times, okay? In general, uh, SLA allows you to have much higher accuracy than any other uh, 3D printing system. It has uh, good speed uh, and flexibility, but we are limited to uh, the use of photopolymers. Uh, okay, so this concludes the lecture, um, and now I have some time uh, if you want to stay uh, to uh, answer your uh, questions.